Tonight, my guest has been on Opie and Anthony, The Late Show with David Letterman, Comedy's Dirtiest Dozens with Chris Rock, Penn and Teller's Bullshit for Showtime, and Howard Stern, the one and only Otto Peterson and his pal George, here tonight. Otto, how the hell are you, man? I'm good, Frankie. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing good, you crazy bastard. Congratulations on your podcast. Yeah. This is the last one I'm doing, by the way. Oh, really? You're getting tired of him? I'm not doing any more any more stuff for free. It includes it, podcast or anything. Well, I'll send you wax for George. How's that? <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> you left out my best credit, Joe Franklin show, four oh, times. Oh, yeah. Everybody's. I've done Joe Franklin. I dressed up as uh, Mario from Donkey Kong for Joe. Are you dead? Yeah, just as a joke, you know. <laughs> I used to I used to bring him a sandwich from the Carnegie Deli. Oh yeah, he loved that. His office, and that's how I would get the date. I would go up there with a hot uh, brisket sandwich and say, "Get the calendar out if you want this sandwich." <laughs> Couldn't turn down free free deli, especially if it was hot. <laughs> Take a, like a three dollar cab ride. <laughs> His office on Forty Second Street. Right, that's right. How I got the date. Uh, otherwise, he would he would kept brushing you off for months and months. He was strange. He was a strange guy. He had the tiniest hands, didn't he? Yeah, he was like almost like not real. He was so so cute. Yeah, he was adorable. Yeah. So, so you're originally from Staten Island. You're a Staten Island boy, huh? Yeah, me, David Johansson, um, Ricky Schroeder, and Christina Aguilera are all from that horrible, horrible borough. Are you in the same street or? No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> so, uh, so you uh, you grew up in Staten Island, and then before you knew it, you got hooked on Paul Winchell, Jerry Mahoney, and Knucklehead Smith, and that started you off, I guess, huh? Yeah, that show just blew my mind, and I had a, a real strong curiosity to see how the inner workings of a puppet and how they worked and everything. And it was very hard to find them at that time. The only ones you can get were uh, the Danny O'Day dolls, which uh, didn't have a hollow back, and the head didn't work. The head didn't move. It was just a. Sta- it was like a doll with a string in the back that moved the mouth. Yeah, I remember that. One of the moving eyes and everything. So I finally found one at a magic store in Times Square that doesn't exist anymore, called um, Louis Tannins. Uh-huh. Uh huh. That's where my my first George was just sitting there in the cabinet with a price tag of three hundred and fifty bucks. So I had to work pretty hard um, saving that money up and got him. And then um, from there, I, you know, I always had my dummies built from this one guy. His name was Howard Olson, who, who had built that George. And um, he lived somewhere in Wisconsin or something, and he used to send me scripts about how to work Jesus into my act because he was like a religious guy. <laughs> he would go to schools with his puppets and do, like, you know, Jesus bits. And, and I, I don't think he would have sold dummies to me if he knew the content of my act, you know. <laughs> I would just shine them on and say, yeah, the Jesus material is working good. Thank you. God bless you. I would end the conversation with that. You know, I give them a load of shit. <laughs> I could just see you with a Jesus dummy talking to <laughs> talking to Jesus. So how was your day today? Ah, I was all hung up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was like sacrilegious humor. Oh, my God. Yeah. I remember the first time I met you... Um, you were a young kid. I was at Dangerfields, and you had come in with George, and you were pissed off. You were all sweaty and everything. You just did a show at the Playboy Club, and you said they pulled the plug on me, and you went on stage, and you were bitching about that. Do you remember that at all? I remember I remember not doing well at the Playboy Club, just somehow not fitting in. You know, Even though the, all the girls were half-dressed, I thought a raunchy act would go, but it was just a... I don't know, it was just, I, just one of those nights where they, they just didn't buy what I was doing. And I got a horrible review in Variety. Um, they, they would review any act that played the Playboy Club, and this guy was brutal, saying that I, I don't belong on stage anywhere, and my act had nothing to do with, with uh, wit, wisdom, or humor. <laughs> and he said it was just a succession of four-letter words, it was, it was, which is pretty much, you know, Pretty much accurate, except you know I'm I'm also funny. You know, there's a lot of four letter words, but I just that night I wasn't funny. So. Well, it's like Richard Pryor uses four letter words. Come on, you know it, it's yeah. the art. It's yeah. the art form, there's, man. Um, there's an art to to what I do. I hope. Yeah, I mean you gotta you know you gotta put that in the in the back back burner and listen to listen to the art. That's when the funny comes, you know. Yeah, but I hate these guys who say they never bomb. I mean, when I bomb, it's 
big time royal like you know people lose their jobs in his meetings people get fired and stuff there's always <laughs> big load of shit when i when i don't do well <laughs> tell me about the story uh, now this is what i heard now I, you know <laughs> now there's different versions of it but i heard you were doing your act and and you started to antagonize some puerto rican guy and he got really mad at George and pulled out a knife and started stabbing him or something. Yeah, this was in Central Park by the um, by the band <laughs> show. Some New Yorkers know where that is. And uh, I would do the you know the street performing out there on Saturdays and Sundays. Do real well. Um, and this one guy, <clears throat> I, I, I knew something was wrong because he was he had a funny look. He was staring at the puppet a little bit too hard, uh, you know, just yeah. not blinking, just glaring at the puppet, and yeah. kind of twitching, and then he finally pulled out a knife, just like West Side Story, and uh, screamed something like El Diablo, you know, like, and then stuck George with the, in the stomach with the knife and then ran off into the park, you know, and uh, it, was just, uh, it was just a weird thing, and then I, I told that story maybe to one person, it just... The story just got around. I, I heard it this way. You were doing your act, and some guy was really, like, giving you shit, and, and, and George says, Hey, what the hell's your problem, you stupid Puerto Rican, you stupid asshole? What the... And then the, the, the guy went nuts and stabbed George, well, and you let him... Well, these embellishments of people who heard the story and just, you know, made it... Yeah, you said, it. This, I'm this, I'm I in, wasn't engaging him at all. I'm embellishing right now, because this yeah, is yeah. what I heard. <laughs> so he fought, you dropped George to the floor. This is what I heard. This is how stories... <laughs> you know get bigger and bigger you dropped george to the floor and he kept stabbing george and you kept throwing your voice get out you stupid son of a bitch you don't hurt me and everybody was like dying when i heard that i i was i was on the floor i couldn't get up i was coughing my brains out laughing my ass no, no, I, I i don't think i i said anything to that it was just too i was just too in shock at the moment <laughs> I still remember George when he says, "When I get up in the morning, she she was so weird. She looked like she had a, around her mouth it looked like a glazed donut. What the hell was that? I forget that joke." Oh, that's a BJ joke. <laughs> Kids out there. Well, you could say what you want. I just don't, you know, don't no no f's, no c word. You know, if you want to say shit, that's fine. You know, the performing days were really good. Uh, you didn't. You started when you wanted to start, and you would quit when, you know, you worked as many shows as you want. I didn't need a microphone. Um, I, I wasn't able to uh, perform to big crowds because, I, you know, I was uh, verbal. The guys who were silent acts like jugglers or magicians could get a crowd of 300 and do really well. So I had to just do small crowds at a, you know, a little bit at a time. But I would do really good out there. And um, it was awesome. And then every once in a while, the cops would chase me. Um, off the corners around the Times Square area, and they would tell me that there's pickpockets working the crowds. And, um, and and if the cops stopped me in the middle of the show, I would get an enormous collection from the audience <laughs> from sympathy. But they'd be angry at the cops to chase me because I was just a, a little kid at the time. Right, right. And uh, if, I mean, if I could have hired a cop to <laughs> mid-show every time, I'd be a rich man today. Cause the collections I would get right, on those right. shows were, were enormous, you know, and I would purposely, you know, pack pack up really slowly and look like sad and broken and really milk it and get a lot of money from the crowds. I, I tell you, you are considered the consummate comics comic because every comic that I know would come down to see you in, at some kind of a late show in the city and we would be on the floor, I mean literally on the floor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's the truth, man. I mean, it, it, it's just brilliant work that you do. And then you work your way around. You worked all the clubs in the city, right? Yeah, the, after a while, you know, the, in, in the winter time, you couldn't do the street at all. So I had to figure out the next move. And then all those showcase clubs were starting up around, you know. Well, the improv had been there for a while, but Catch Rising Star was the hot place. I was always intimidated to go there. Then I found that club, Good Times, downtown. And right. I, I fit in good there. Right. It'd be the big fish in a small pond there. I was, I was always intimidated by catch and stayed away from there. But, you know, a little by little, I, I, I wound up going there and, and just hanging out, never really becoming a regular there. But, you know, Seinfeld, Larry David, and all those guys were there at the time. So I got to know them a little. I thought you were as formidable to uh, Gilbert Godfrey, to, if, if to anybody. You and him would be on the same level. Oh. I, I mean, y your comedy is just brilliant. I mean, 
what you do with, with George. And, you know, your lips do move. I want... I'm working on that, Frankie. It's only been 35 years. I'm getting it down now. That's the amazing thing, though. We know your lips are moving. We know George is talking. And we still accept it, though. It, 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 that's, how, that's why it's so brilliant, too. I mean, just to watch. And what you did on Letterman was, was unbelievable, too. You actually turned around and showed the audience the dummy's back with your hand stuck in there. Yeah, well, it's about creating an illusion. I think I do that pretty good. <laughs> Um, yeah, the Letterman show was good. Didn't really help my price for the club dates, but it was it was a good experience being yeah. on that stage, you know. And how did you get involved with Opie and Anthony? How did that work out for you? I was brought up there <clears throat> first time as a birthday present for Anthony, um, who I guess had seen <laughs> me. But I had known Opie from a club in uh, Huntington, Long Island, called Fast Eddie's. Uh-huh. It's also called Top of the Town at one point. Yeah. And um, Opie used to come and see me there all the time when he was just a college student. So I knew him a long time, and I knew um, I knew Jim Norton, of course. And then uh, and then from from that one appearance, I did a I did a bunch of uh, you know when they did the afternoon show on NEW, I used to do that all the time. Yeah. To plug to plug Carolines and Rascals and all those clubs. Now there's also a big controversy about Dice Clay. Uh, how, how did you feel about that with the uh, uh, the nursery rhymes that he was doing that I believe are yours? Um, yeah, well, I did the nursery rhymes in my act, and then I, I dropped it. I guess I didn't see the potential for that that he did. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, well, we, me and I saw all the way back to the beginning at the uh, Pips, and there was a club called... Uh, the Crazy Country Club in Brooklyn. I remember that there. place. I remember that um, place. And then, and then those days, Dice used to just do um, an imitation of Jerry Lewis. He would do uh, the Nutty Professor, and then he would do first he would do Travolta, then he would do I think he would close with Jerry Lewis, and then later on he did um, uh, Elvis, like an Elvis song. But he didn't have the Dice character at all. He was just pretty much an impressionist uh-huh. hid behind those few voices and then and he would set up these shows and I, and I would do like the bulk at a time I would do like 50 you know 50 minutes to an hour and then he would come up and do his 20 minutes at the end and be like the, the headliner even though he only had like 20 minutes and he would you know he would pay me so he was pretty, like the producer of the show and right. his parents were always there he knew his parents pretty good and then he, then he went out to L.A., and then that's when everybody was going, Dice is doing your stuff out there. How do you feel about that? And I was like, well, you know, well, you know, I think he should have asked me, but... Um, he should have compensated you, too. Credit, he, you know, he saw more potential. I don't think it's right to steal other guys' stuff. I, I think that, that um, the pleasure of, of, of writing a joke and then having it work is, is the kick of, of what we do. Yeah. Uh, when, when, you, when you're doing somebody else's stuff, um, it, it's it's not it's not the same reaction if you, it, it, as if you had come up with it yourself. I think I think if you're if you're at like if you're if you're bombing at a bachelor party or something and you reach into somebody else's bag of tricks just to survive that set, that's one thing. But mm-hmm. if, if you mm-hmm. go from a friend of yours and then make it a regular part of your act, uh, I, you know that's immoral. You know? Yeah, so, I don't think I don't think that was right. Any, I have no ill will. It's, it's unhealthy to carry. A uh, grudge that big, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's not healthy for me. And I saw him a few weeks ago at uh, Jim Florentine's wedding. So you know, we talked. And it was cool. Yeah, yeah. I think what he did was, I think he took a, a little bit of Elvis. He took a little bit of uh, your anger. He took a little bit of Otto, and he took a little bit of all his what, whatever he had, and then slowly melded all that together. To that's where Dice was born, actually. Yeah, and, and a lot of the, the idea of the nutty professor, the idea that you could become a completely different person, and it's, they're talking about the Jerry Lewis version, not mm. the Eddie Murphy version, right. where he becomes the abrasive buddy love character, which is, which is I think, well, that movie was a very big influence on the uh, genesis of the Dice character and everything. Right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's a fun day's pips. I don't have any bad feelings about that guy, you know. Whatever. Did his cousin, what, I think it was his brother, did he pass away? Did he have a brother at Pips, the owner? Seth and Marty? Yeah. The owners? Yeah. I was, Seth, um, Seth took passed, his life. Seth passed away? Was it Marty that passed away? It was Seth, yeah. Seth was the brother. Yeah, I, I ran into him in L.A. He was, uh, he yeah. was doing some, some work on, uh, some fireman show or something. He was dressed as a fireman. Oh, and, really? Uh, yeah, that was about, geez, got to be about 
nine years ago. And that uh, was a really cool guy. I yeah, he was of nice. Stuff of his on YouTube, he was really good friends with Andy Kaufman, and he got this. Uh, he he got Andy to talk as himself and not do the latka or do the um, that other Tony Clifton guy. And uh, and the footage that that he shot of Andy just talking off stage was what what Jim Carrey studied for his performance in Man a Man in the Moon because. Um, he had a trust issue, uh, Kaufman. He didn't trust a lot of people, but he, he really loved Seth. Yeah, yeah. Seth was a good. He was a good guy. I, I kind of liked the him. Great more. guy. He was just really good to the comics. Really encouraged you. If you had a bomb or if you were just having a, a bad month, he would always give you a good pep talk. And then there was the there was there was the Marty camp. Marty was his other brother, and and it was like if you were friends with Seth. You automatically weren't going to be friends with Marty. It wasn't like you 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 chose not to be friends with uh, both brothers. It was just that's just the way it was there. They didn't get along, and it was just two different kinds of people. I mean, I remember one quote you gave me a long time ago, and I usually usually tell people this, and then I quote Otto Peterson when I do it. it uh, I remember one time I was trying to get a gig somewhere, and they were really giving me a lot of shit, and you just turned around and smiled at me and said, Frank, I don't go to parties I'm not invited to. I, yeah, I thought that know, was a great like, quote. Like the thing with the Borgata, it's like I knew Ray Garvey forever, and he ne- you know, when he took over that room, I was like, it would be great to work there, but you know, he just saw it. For some reason, he just didn't think I was, I was right for that room, so I didn't, want, I didn't let it fester in my stomach yeah because uh, atlantic city's on uh, less than 90 minutes from where i reside and it's a great room you know i just what the hell you know well you're true to yourself and i think that works for you and yeah. uh you're, you're you're one of a kind you really are how did howard stern take to you stern was great Stern was great but i, I don't think he really ever saw me kill in a club i i think he saw me more as an interesting uh unstable character to interview it was, you know, not not fully crazy, but just odd. And so I, I don't think he... With the Stern Show, you're either like a big, big movie star or you're one of his whack packs, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, the retards and the and the midgets, or you're just like a, a porno star. It's like, and I, I think I was more in the category of the second one, just like an oddball type guy. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, did, I did perform at Gary's Bachelor Party, and Stern was was uh it was real cool he got the crowd to shut up and listen to me because i had no chance if he didn't do that because everybody was real drunk and there were uh strippers per, you know performing lesbian shows in the corner and then all of a sudden i have to do my stupid stand-up for these guys in the middle of all this you know <laughs> caligula type activity how was george taking it yeah it was, it was, i couldn't wait to get out of there it's like i just i just didn't feel like i fit in you know and it, you know, it's one thing when you're an invited guest, but then when, when you have to perform, you're in a different. Yeah. I couldn't just hang out and relax at the party, you know. Right, and then you did Penn and Teller. How were you received well with them? Well, yeah. I mean, they put me in, in the Aristocrats movie. They put me on uh, the bullshit show, and I also did a thing called Sin City Spectacular. Mm-hmm. I just saw them a couple of weeks ago in Vegas, and they're always cool. Penn's kind of a he's kind of an asshole, to tell you the truth. He's He's always a little bit opinionated and rude, and he's like he he lacks social manners. Like I I had met his wife at the David Copperfield show like two days earlier, and I said, uh, "Pen, I uh, I met your wife. She was really nice." And he like didn't even answer that. Uh, you know, I'm just and I'm trying to make conversation backstage. Maybe he was they're high. Like, they're eating at dinner. This is after their show. They're eating at dinner, and uh, I'm trying to keep the conversation going, and it was just grunts and one word answers yeah i understand you're tired after a show and stuff but i don't understand why they made a big deal out of bringing me backstage you know they had one of their uh, assistants come over to my table and, and like uh, make sure that uh, i was brought back to their dressing room and wait for him and stuff and then and then you get backstage and the guy, the guy doesn't talk to you so oh, so weird. that happened to me with sinatra jr I, I, I opened for him a few times, and then he had me come to this big dinner that they had in a private room. Yeah. And uh, I came up there with my wife, and we sat down, and he never said a word to me during the whole, the whole dinner. I just looked at my wife and go, maybe we should go for a burger. What are we doing here? That's very weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's, I, don't know, I don't know what's wrong with them. I, I don't know if they don't know how to function anymore, or they 
they just beyond themselves or I, I don't get it I don't I don't know how to deal with it I don't even bother anymore I mean, they do a great act and and um, and the other guy Teller the one who doesn't speak I've had some really good conversations with him but with uh, with Teller it's always like he's big and loud and uh, the fr first time I brought Trish um, to Vegas we, we met them and he was telling this story about those was this ventriloquist that, he, that lived in the 1920s or 30s, and he said the guy worked with a, a real dog on stage, and he had a mechanical lower jaw to open and close. Uh -huh. The dog was the puppet right, right, by right. dog. So Trish uh, goes, well, didn't that hurt the dog? And Penn goes, that's not the fucking point, and screamed at her. <laughs> and, uh, it was like, and she was like, after that, she goes, oh, my God, a major celebrity just screamed at me. <laughs> it's like, screw him. He, you know, he's just a big bully, you know. Just a fat, ma fat magician, that's all. Yeah, he's a big, <laughs> he's a big tall guy, and he's, he's a celebrity, so uh, nobody calls him on his shit. You know? I tell you one thing, if he cuts that ponytail, I, I could use it, make a nice wig out of it for my yeah. hair. <laughs> You you never used any other dummies. Did you ever have the need, or did you ever feel like you know George needed a, a friend like Knucklehead Smith? I did Smith? have this uh, other dummy I, I had for about a month. I was trying out, and, and he was going to be a gay a gay character, and his name was Phil Fruit, and and I was never able to um, I was never able to work with 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 the left hand as well as I could with the right hand, and there was that one problem. I didn't feel comfortable enough to. To do Phil alone, and I wanted it to be, you know, I wanted to have George, you know, already, already up and running, and then introduce the Phil character somehow. So I could never uh, figure out the logistics of that. Yeah, and yeah. Then, and then the other problem was now I got to schlep two boxes around. Yeah, I know. In the category right. where I can, you know, hire roadies and stuff. So yeah. That was just mixed. That whole yeah. whole Th thing. That <laughs> That's what I did. I, I had a big, tremendous suitcase when I started doing props. I had this, and you know, it had wheels on it and a freaking steering wheel, and pretty soon I was going to put an engine in it and drive it around like a Volkswagen. And I said to myself, enough of this crap, and I just, I, I got a little suitcase, and I just compacted everything down. You to, scaled it down, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, like, you know, I, I, I watched Lenny Schultz drive around with his truck and the wood. With a, with a van, you know, tremendous truck with all this crap in there. And I said, I, I can't do this for the rest of my life. This is insane. So that's why I, I scaled down and I was happy. And yeah, it's uh, a lot of carrying. I know. Like, you know, there's these, there's these magicians that, that have these big, giant illusions. And when I was a street act, the guys that I worked with would just, they would just have their whole act would be in their pocket. They would have a deck of cards, they would have a half a dozen uh, silver dollars, then they would have that uh, silk a silk uh, handkerchief that turns into a cane and that collapses into uh, right. like a tiny cigarette lighter size right. and then they had uh, the fake rubber thumb to make the silk disappear and then they had some sponge balls so everything could be shoved into two pockets yeah because it, it, it's, it's really a production to, 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 to do these big shows unless you got like you said you got the, produ the producers to, to spend the money to get you to do those big shows yeah yeah so it's crazy but uh, uh, how's everything going? You doing okay? Yeah, man. Um, uh, work is starting to come in. It was really bad for a while. I was like, you know, you start to get thoughts like maybe this is the end of stand-up and maybe I've, I've become irrelevant and everybody else is going to continue on and I'm, and I'm just somehow, my, you know, the engine has just died and I'm just stuck here. But then the phone starts ringing. I got a couple of weeks in January in, in Canada called, it's called the Cold Dark Jan January Tour, where there are these clubs up in Ontario that usually just use Canadian guys, but they bring in uh, American headliners for this January yeah. thing and pay a little better. So I got that two weeks up there, what? and I got a gig in Atlanta. What about England? Yeah, I'd like to get to England. I've never been offered that or had any help getting over there, but I think I would do well there. Uh, gee, I wonder, Eddie Brill was in England for a while. Maybe we should try to get in touch with him. Yeah. I, I wonder I, if he would. I, I found asking people for help is, is just it's really bad for me physically and emotionally. And, and, they, and nothing ever really comes of it. And then, you know, it's like they, they, these people want you to, um, no, nobody, basically human nature is nobody really helps anybody. You're lucky, you know, if, if you could count on your family, but I never counted on anybody so i'm 
I, I'm pretty much giving up on asking anybody for anything. You know. Well, you know what it is. I know. I find. I'm in an uncomfortable position. Yeah, I find this with. I find this with actors that they are afraid to get you work because if you fail, then it's it's detrimental to them and they look bad, and that that's why you very rarely get help from you know other other actors and even in the comedy business i guess it's the same you know it's uh, guys are afraid Wait, you'll a take a lot of comics out starting out get gigs um recently i brought a friend of mine i was doing um governors and uh mcguire's and i brought this comic out and he wound up hosting the two nights and then at the end of it i, I uh when i was getting paid i said to the girl at, McGu- at uh, Governors, I go, well, what about Keith? Shouldn't he get paid for the MC? I don't know what you pay an MC, but you should give him some money. And then, uh, and then uh, he, he, they wrote a check out to him, and then they bounced it on him. Oh, God. He called the, the guy who books it, and he said, he, he didn't speak to me. He spoke to um, uh, another comic that was on that show, and he told him, he goes, I didn't, want, I didn't appreciate Otto storming into the office and strong-arming my pregnant wife. And oh, God. I go, I go, great. Now... Keith's not going to get the gig, and I'm I'm never going to work there again. So now I just lost three weekend rooms. So I was I was really upset. I go, this is what I get for trying to help somebody. Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> I, I cleared it all up with him, yeah. so we're we're cool. Uh, yeah. And that end, they're going to still use me, but I'm I'm pretty much fed up with helping people anyway. Yeah, it, it gets it gets out of hand, and uh, the ones that the, Joey uh, Joey Cola helped somebody, and uh, the guy actually tried to take his work away from him. So there you go. You know, it's uh, yeah, that's really rotten. Yeah, it is. It's it's really. Yeah, you know what? I, you know, I was watching Roseanne's roast because Mike Mike Rowe was on the show. You know, Mike Rowe. Yeah. Mike Rowe was on. He was on for a while, and he was telling me he was going to do the Roseanne roast. So I decided to watch it, and I, I kept thinking. Why isn't Otto on that show? Yeah. Why are you not on Comedy Central? Damn, were you and you and George roasting these people? Oh my God. I don't know. Comedy Central seems to be a click to me, you know. And the, the new, I mean, when you watch stand up, do you like hate it as much as I do? I, I, I mean, when's the last time a comedian has made you laugh, like caught you off guard, or made you crack up? I mean, I can't think of anybody since. I think the last time I saw you. <laughs> oh, that's real sweet. I appreciate that. I do. No, I know what you're saying. I, there are some. There's a lot of funny guys out there, but you know what happens to us? We become numb. Yeah, we, numb. And, and we 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 look we look at a comedian. We go, that's funny. Yeah. That's funny. That's that sucked. That's funny. With Seinfeld, I always thought, you know, he was clever, not funny. Like. When, when he, he writes a joke, it's obviously a well-written joke. Yeah. And I would go, oh, that's clever. But I didn't laugh the way, like, Dangerfield made me laugh. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He was just a funny human being. Right, right, right. Seinfeld was just a clever Jewish boy, you know. Well, I, I, the thing I got, the bone I have to pick with Comedy Central is, is the fact that they're just a big eating machine. Yeah. and And they give everybody... Uh, uh, a chance to get up there that and these a lot of these guys aren't really ready to get that chance and mm-hmm. they think right off the bat they're headliners and then when you see them in the club they're really they're really middle acts you know they're not really ready and you know and then what it does is it makes everybody else go well gee I could do comedy it's simple then before you know it, you got 85,000 people running around out there That's true. thinking they're comics it's become like a play where there's so much bad stand up on television that everybody at home goes, I'm funnier than that guy, and they are funnier than that guy. And, and so every day there's busloads of unfunny people arriving in New York uh, trying to live this dream out, and the odds of becoming the next Ray Romano or Seinfeld are lower than, than hitting the lottery. Yeah, well, there's no, no more agents going in clubs, no more producers, no more writers. They're, they're going other places. They're using actors now in, in uh, situation comedies. No, they're not using comedians as much anymore. There were only two people... That, that would discover the Catch a Rising Star. Freddie Prince and Pat Benatar. Yeah. And all the rest of them made it somehow, you know, uh, through other uh, means, you know, getting to the Tonight Show or whatever. But those are the only two people that were actually pulled right out of that club into stardom. Yeah, and uh, I think the comic strip had Eddie Murphy and Chris Rock. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And, and uh, I, I think, I don't, I don't know where Adam Sandler came from, but I think he slowly developed through... Saturday Night Live. I don't think he, he was pulled out of a club right away. Yeah, I did a bunch of shows with him right right before he got on SNL in that short period when he was doing the crummy Phil Selman gigs and stuff. 
mm. get some fun working together. Yeah. Him and Bob Woods. Bobby Woods, I loved. Did a bunch of shows together. Did yeah. you, you ever hear that? that? It was really nice. Did I, you ever I was hear, glad when he made it. Did you ever hear that Bobby Woods story where, uh, what's that guy that goes in the world of magic? Great, great, great. What's his name? Do you remember him? Right. I know who you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Well, he just finished doing his set and it was snowing outside at Eastside Comedy Club. And, uh, <clears throat> he said, and Bobby was standing out there in the snow. So he says to him, he says, Bobby, what are you doing? He says, well, you know, I, I kind of need a ride, you know. Oh. So can you drive me to my car? He says, what's the matter with your car? Is it running? He says, no, can you just drive me to my car? And then as he drove him to his car in the snow, he realized this is where Bobby lived because he had divorced his wife and had no place to live, and he was sleeping in his car. So Bobby gets out of the car, and he turns around and looks at looks at this guy, and he says, uh, you want to come in for a drink? <laughs> That's uh, Bobby Woods, who passed away many, many years ago. A, a brilliant, funny comedian, man. And you're a brilliant guy, and I want to thank you for coming on the show, Otto. Thanks, Frankie. Man. I can't wait to see you in person. You know, it's been, it's been way too long. Yeah, we'll run into each other one of these days. Yeah, okay, the next time, you know, I'm in Queens or Brooklyn, you know, we'll find a way to meet for a sandwich or something. Yeah, I definitely got to see George again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and all you people listening, uh, you know, look at my website, ottoandgeorge.com, yeah. and all that stuff on YouTube is up there. Thank you, man. Yeah, you have MySpace, too? Are you on there? I'm, I'm on all that stuff, um, yeah. MySpace, Facebook, Twitter. You're doing Twitter? All that crap. Good. Good for you, man. <laughs> Good for you. I love that laugh. Take care of yourself, Otto. You're a sweetheart. I love you, man. And, and lots lots more good stuff for you, brother. Okay. Thanks, Frank. All Have right. a great one. Bye. Take care. You've been listening to my interview with Otto Peterson and George, X-rated comedian, one of the funniest guys you will ever see.